Sorry I'm late. Oh, it's okay. We're glad you're here. Mmm. That coffee is hot. Isn't that the worst? Oh, I just burnt my tongue. You know what? You think that's hot? You gotta try that burn like 10 billion times worse all over your entire body as you fall into the pits of hell because you haven't surrendered your life over to the will of Jesus Christ. Huh? That's a burn you won't get over. <laughs> I saved you a cookie. So gospel conversations is our topic for today. And uh, some of you, you, you feel like it's about that awkward to enter into that conversation. We're going to talk about how that works and how God works in it. One of the interesting things, if you're studying through the Gospels, those accounts of Jesus' life and ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're, those of you who are guests, we're making our way through John's Gospel right now. We're in chapter 4 today, and we're looking at a story, is how many times Jesus had a conversation with someone. Now, there are times when he's speaking to a big multitude and there's a crowd out there. But over and over again, you find Jesus just talking to an individual, just talking to somebody. And we learn a lot always from Jesus' example. But when it comes to sharing the gospel, there's a lot to learn. Because when a willing witness intersects with a seeking soul, there's some eternal things that can start happening there. And we're going to look at an example of that today as Jesus has a conversation with a woman at a well in Samaria. So this is from John's Gospel, chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 1. Now. I always like how when a chapter starts like that. Now. Clear the table. New story. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he, talking about Jesus, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Judea's in the south, Galilee's in the north, and Jesus is heading back to more of his home territory, uh, close to the Sea of Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. Now, that's an important part. If you've never marked anything in John chapter 4, why don't you mark that part? He had to pass. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now, again, just some background story here John gives us. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And again, John gives us some information we need culturally, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come to draw water. Then Jesus said to her, and Jesus really shifts gears here, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, well, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. Now, when you get to verse 19, she starts changing the subject. She wants to get into a deep theological discussion about sidebar issues that Jesus brings her back to center. And then in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? 
So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Now, most of you, if you've been around church life for any time at all, you're familiar with a good church word, the word grace. And most often, when we use the word grace, we, we use it in terms of forgiveness, that we are forgiven from our sin, from our brokenness by the Lord. And that's certainly a part of grace. But I think one of my favorite definitions of grace I've ever heard is grace is the power of God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That sometimes grace is a saving grace, and sometimes grace is an empowering grace to carry us forward to the areas where we just don't have anything left. The reason we start with grace is because we can't heal our pain, we can't heal and redeem our past on our own. Just like this woman, we need something beyond ourselves, and Jesus offers us everything we need to come to him, to be forgiven, to be restored, all things new. Now, this woman... Think about her story. She's been stuck in a life and a lifestyle, and Jesus reveals it in that one statement. You have no husband. You've had five husbands. The one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. She's had five marriages. She's on her way to the sixth and doesn't, doesn't hold out great hope that that's going to go well. The fact is she came to draw water outside the city all alone in the middle of the day, all unusual things because she wants to avoid people one of the things we we learn culturally about the woman at the wells there's water sources in Sychar she's outside now this is a deep well an ancient well a historic well well of Jacob and she is uh, she's going out Women typically went as groups. It's like when you go out to eat with a group of women and they all go to the restroom at the same time. They all went to gather water at the same time. And so here they go. They go to gather water at the same time because it's a social situation. It's also a shared labor situation when they go to gather water at a well. And they would go early or late, not in the middle of the day when it's really hot. So the only reason that this woman... This Samaritan woman is going when she's going at high noon is because she doesn't want to see anybody. She doesn't want to talk to anybody. She doesn't want to have to deal with anyone because she's a moral outcast. Her reputation is known in, in, in Sychar. She's just tired of the accusing looks, the whispers as she walks by, and she's stuck. With all the guilt and all the shame that she has, she's stuck. And she's stuck in a lifestyle that she doesn't feel like she can change, she can't break free from, she can't escape. And maybe, maybe you've been in a spot like that where it's a habit or it's a pattern of behavior and you just feel trapped. And you say, I know what I should do and what I should not do, but I keep repeating the same behavior over and over and over again. I keep, I keep stumbling at the same spot and I just don't know how to break free. I don't know how to change. And I can imagine her at this point in her life, five husbands working on number six. This is my life. And there's no reason to think it's going to get any better. And I'm just going to be in this repetitive, destructive pattern forever and ever. And it's always going to feel dark. And it's always going to be hard. And I just can't change on my own. I'm stuck. And that verse 4 where it says Jesus had to go to Samaria. This is the reason he had to go. The phrase is interesting because Jesus not only did not have to go to Samaria, but most often a Jewish man would not go to Samaria. The, the description, he's in, the, he's in Judea in the south. That's where Jerusalem is and Bethlehem, a lot of familiar places to us. But typically, a Jewish man traveling, he would, he would go east. I'll do it this way. Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Jordan River connecting him. Jerusalem's over here. He'd go east to Jericho. At Jericho, he'd cut across, 
go up the east side of the Jordan River Valley and then cut back across when he got to Galilee. And the reason was you have Galilee and you have Judea, but in between was Samaria. And the Jewish people so despised the Samaritan people. And this had gone on for seven centuries. Uh, they thought so lowly of each other as cultures. They wanted to have nothing to do with one another. And Jesus goes through Samaria because he had to. Because it was a divine appointment. There was a, there was a gospel conversation that just needed to take place. There's a lesson for our lives in that, and I feel it. We tend to avoid places that are hard. We tend to avoid things that are painful, shameful, things that are sin, things that are dark. We want to go around and we want to avoid and we want to deny and ignore. But the text says Jesus has to go to these places because lost people are in those places. Broken people are in those places who need hope who need forgiveness, who need the gospel. So wherever there is pain, Jesus has to go. And wherever there are broken relationships and marriage and friendships, Jesus has to go. Where there is addiction, he has to go. And Jesus doesn't avoid or go around our sin and our brokenness, but he intersects with us and he reaches out to us and he cares for us and he moves toward us, finds us in it and gives us hope beyond it. There's a, a Christian writer and professor named Tony Campolo. And uh, I heard him when I was a college student, and, and I heard him tell this story. And he's told it lots of times. It, it's one of my favorite uh, stories out there. He was going to speak at a small Christian college. And so he arrived at the site, and they had a group of people gathered up, and they were going to pray for him before he went out to speak. Pray for him, pray for the students that were going to be hearing his message. And, and before he spoke, this little prayer meeting gathers up, circles up, and people are praying one at a time, taking turns. Not a big circle, but they're praying. And then it gets to this one guy. And uh, Tony Campolo tells, tells that, this guy starts praying, and he starts praying, not for the students, not for Tony. He starts praying for Charlie Stoltzfus. Here's what he prays. Something like this. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stoltzfus. He lives in that silver trailer home down the road about a mile. You know the trailer, Lord. It's the one that's on the right-hand side of the road. A good informational prayer. You know, God's always looking for good information. And... Tony said, as this prayer goes on, he, he just opens one eye like, what in the world is this guy doing? He continued his prayer. He said, you know, Lord, Charlie, that he left his wife and kids this morning, Lord, and we pray you'd step in and do something, that you'd bring that family back together. Amen. This was on his heart. It's what he shared in the prayer. Well, the prayer session ended. Tony Campolo, he goes in. He lets fly, uh, preaching, his, uh, preaching his message to the college students. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He climbs in his car. He's heading back, back home. And on his way home, he's driving down the highway, and he sees a guy standing on the side of the road looking for a ride, thumb out. He pulled over, looked like a pretty safe guy, and said, Hey, you need a ride? Yeah, I need a ride. The guy climbed the car with him. He said, Hey, my name's Tony Campolo. He said, My name is... Charlie Stoltzfus. Tony said his eyes grew a little wide. He knew what he had to do. So he started driving. There was an exit just a little ways down the highway. He turned off the first exit, went over, overpassed, and headed back the other direction on the highway. Charlie said, Mr., where are you going? He was a little nervous about the ride that he just, maybe I'm a kidnap victim now. I'm not sure what's going on. He said, where are you going? Where are you taking me? And he said, I'm taking you home. And he said, why are you taking me home? And Tony said, because you left your wife and kids this morning. At this point, Charlie Stoltzfus is really, really uncomfortable. As he just pushes up against the door on the passenger side, watches his, uh, 
driving host. Tony drove back by the school, down the road, about a mile on the right-hand side of the road. There was uh, a silver trailer home, just like the guy had prayed. Charlie was a little bit in shock. He said, how do you know where I live? Campolo said, God told me where you live. He pulled in. They went into the house. Tony shared with Charlie, with his wife. This is the gospel. This is who Jesus is and how much he loves. Both of them made a commitment of their lives to Christ that day. And he got them into counseling. And they started repairing what was broken in their marriage. And, and today, uh, the story goes, Charlie Stolzfus is a pastor. Which I, I guess you would be after that, huh? It'd do something to you. And that's what grace looks like. It's the power of God to do that which we cannot do for ourselves. I don't know what degree you feel it today, but we know you're broken too. Maybe you're lost too. And there's too much pain. And the power of God will come to find you when you run from it. And it'll bring you back to God when you're hurting or bring you to God for the first time. And that's where God's healing always, always, always begins. Just a whole lot of reaching out from him. A whole lot of grace. You need to know this. You need to see this picture of God for who he really is. Because God pursues us. He comes looking for us. And, and not with an accusing finger. Not with a judgmental. He comes with grace and love and bringing hope. To capture us and draw us close to himself. And he'll do it through the power of the Holy Spirit and do it through people who are just willing to have a conversation. Now, I want to invite some folks up to join me. We have some storytellers here today. Come on up, uh, four of you. Got some folks who are going to share uh, some gospel conversation stories. Now, in this season of our church life, we've had a lot of people sharing uh, a lot of stories and telling folks, uh, engaging with them in conversation about Jesus. And so we just gathered up four that had a recent story, good story, and wanted you to hear just gospel conversation. So, Rafael Rosario, glad you were here, my brother. He has a great story in a great context. Tell us your story. Okay, uh, last week I was at Six Flags uh, with my family, and I was there in the kids' area, playground, and with my little one. And a man from Six Flags um, approached me. He was from the market department, he was doing surveys. And then he said, are, we, are you willing to do a survey? I said, yes, sure. Spent two minutes with him and answer all his questions. And then right after we finish, and then I said, hey, can I share something with you that changed my life? So he said, yeah, yeah, you can share. So um, I took my phone. I didn't have a paper or anything. I took my phone. I had this sticker with the three circles in the back of my phone. And I shared the gospel with him using the three circles too. And at the end, I said, uh, his name is Gary. So, Gary, where do you find yourself? Are you in brokenness or are you in relationship with God? And he said, oh, I'm somewhere in the middle. So, cutting short, uh, I, I talked to him. As cutting short, he, he said that he believed that Jesus died for his sins and was raised from the dead. But he never surrendered his life to Jesus. And I asked him, I said, uh, Gary... I want to give you an opportunity for you to surrender your life to Jesus right now. Do you want to surrender your life to Jesus? And he looked at me and said, yes, I want that. So, yeah, we can do here right now. So I'm going to pray. You repeat after me, and we'll be done. So right there in the playground with the kids, I pray. He repeated, and he accepted Jesus Christ in his life and surrendered his life to Jesus. So. Yeah, praise the Lord. That's an awesome story. And, and so, so when, you, uh, when you loaded up to go to Six Flags, you think, 
Well, my main job here is going to be to share the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> but you were ready to share the gospel. And that's, go. that's, the, that's a lot of it. It's just yeah. your radar's up, and you there look you to see where God's at work. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I love that story. And so often, uh, and I found this to be true, too, God brings them to you. Yes. That, that's yeah. the amazing part. And th that one was an easy one because he was looking for attention, right, looking for people. He came <laughs> to me. I said, all right, now it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah, and how God, make, God creates the divine appointment. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, thank you, thank you. John Wooldridge, tell us a good gospel story. Uh, I'm going to share a story from a few months ago. I was at work, and uh, I was leaving a little bit late at night, and there was hardly anybody left in the building, and I got on the elevator to go downstairs, and and said, okay, God, if there's somebody sitting at the front desk, I'll go talk to him. And sure enough, there was a guy sitting at the front desk watching the cameras. And I went up to him, offered to pray for him. And he welcomed prayer. And, and I said, hey, can I share with you this picture of something that's changed my life? And he said, yeah, sure, go for it. And so I shared the gospel with him using the three circles. And I asked him, do you find yourself over in brokenness? Or do you think you're in a relationship with God? And he said, well, I'm definitely in the brokenness. And so I asked him, is there anything keeping you from surrendering to Jesus right now? And he said, well, I feel like I need to clean up my life a little bit. I've got some things going on. I'm not really honoring the Lord with several things. And uh, so I was able to encourage him that you can receive forgiveness right now from all of your sins. And um, he wasn't ready to surrender that night. But the next week, I ran into him at the same time, same place, and offered to share a Bible story with him. And so I uh, read Luke 7 with him, where Jesus forgives a sinful woman. And I said, which character in this story do you identify with? And he said, well, the sinful woman for sure. And I said, me too. And we have a great hope, though, that Jesus forgave this sinful woman. She was forgiven all of her sins, and you can have that too. And that reminds me of that picture I showed you where, you know, you can come out of this brokenness. You can have a relationship with God. Uh, and so is there anything that's still stopping you from surrendering to Christ? And he said, no, there's not. And he prayed to receive Christ right there. And even afterwards, he was telling me that he had already shared uh, the picture with his girlfriend and that he felt like it was his responsibility now to pass it along to others and the perfect timing of it was that right as I was finishing talking to him one of my coworkers got off the elevator and saw me talking to him and said hey you know that guy and I said yeah I met him last week get to share with him this picture of something that's changed my life can I show you and uh, led to another gospel conversation with a coworker who was a professing believer himself that's awesome and, and so much as just putting your sail up okay God if there's somebody just, just open the door, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready. And having, uh, uh, because you began first time. How did you start the conversation? Offered to pray for him. Offered to pray for him, and man, people are really open to prayer. And uh, then just having the transitions to move straight to the gospel, it's awesome. So, work, workplace. Uh, so we have uh, amusement park, workplace. <laughs> All right, Gail Smith, tell us a good gospel story. All right, there's a small group, um, small and growing group of us in Anna that are going out into um, a community, and we are sharing the gospel with people and knocking on doors. And before we go out, we pray for houses of peace, you know, that God is at work uh, preparing hearts and minds for hearing this gospel message. And in this one case in particular, we knocked on the door of a house of a woman named Brittany, and when she opened the door, we told her that, you know, we're just out in the community. We're just uh, sharing God's love, and we want to pray for people. We know that, you know, people are having a difficult time. There's a lot of brokenness. Is there anything that she had that uh, we could pray for her? And instantly, she just really um, literally grabbed us and brought us into the house and said, we have had some very difficult life circumstances. Uh, we're new here, and we would love for you to pray for us. We've, we've lost our jobs, and we just need God's help. So we prayed for her and then um, started talking about the 15-second um, testimony. We shared the 15-second testimony and asked her if she'd ever given her life to the Lord. And she said, yeah, yeah, you know, I go to this church, but, you know, we're new here. And we haven't found a church yet. And I said, well, that's great. Can I share this gospel sharing tool with you so that if you have other people that you encounter that maybe you can share the gospel with them. We're trying really hard to, to make sure people know the gospel of Jesus Christ. She said, sure. By this time, her husband joins in, her mother-in-law joins in, and we share the three circles with them. And in sharing the three circles, we found that she had been going to church for a long time, but she'd really never surrendered her life, nor had her husband. And so at this time, they'd all 
surrendered their life, or the two of them had, and the mother recommitted her life to the Lord. And so it was just a great opportunity for us to be reminded that just because people say they're Christians, and just because people go to a church, does not necessarily mean they've ever made that commitment. So it was just a, just a great story, great opportunity for us. Yeah, thank you, Gail. And, uh, and, and, I, and I feel that those of you who've been going, going out, many of you have, uh, whether it's people you already know or people that we're, we're just reaching out into the community, I find a lot of people who say, I'm a Christian. A lot of us say, oh, yeah, I have a neighbor or neighbors, and oh, yeah, they're Christians. They're good people. Um, and that's a great opening. Just, well, then you're going to love this. It's the Jesus story. And, and to share the gospel, when, when they actually hear the gospel, that's a lot different than just going to church. And uh, there's a great opening. And again, how God just prepares the way ahead of us. It's not us trying to argue anybody into the kingdom. It's just caring about people enough to point them to the Savior. So thank you, Gail. Tom Stogsdill, tell us a good Jesus story. Well, this story starts uh, several months ago, and uh, the end of the story has not yet happened. But uh, for the last several months, I've been going out uh, Wednesday nights with uh, my wife, Susan, and uh, Sundays with uh, some great uh, friends and been out to share together as teams. And uh, a few weeks ago in March, it just so happened, circumstances came together that Susan and I were going to go out, and our daughter was at our house, and we said, would you go out with us tonight? And she could, so she, she went out with us. It was just a last-minute kind of thing. And I immediately just said, Lord, do something special tonight, would you? We, uh, we knocked on some doors at the apartment, and there was uh, one door we knocked on. A guy named Joe lived behind that door. And I learned later that, you know, as he looked through the peephole, he saw three people out there. And so he had to make a decision, am I going to open this door or not? And I share that simply to say that God's already been working. All right. He opened the door. Miracle one. Not only that, he welcomed us inside to another miracle right there that we could uh, share time with him and it was obvious that he was new in town because he had no furniture he said i just come from california and starting a new life and business here in the area we shared the, the the three circles with him and he prayed right there and said yes to jesus that night we began as soon as we could to uh, disciple him we started meeting with joe uh, weekly and he started coming to pattern discipleship uh, group here at church but uh, one of the things that we shared early on was, you know, how can, who do you know that you could share this with? And he said, well, I am my mother, my family, brother. I've got a girlfriend in, in California. And so he shared the three circles with his girlfriend named Sarah. And, uh, and as we were coming together just this past Wednesday to meet with Joe, Sarah was in town. And we, at the Starbucks, we got to, to visit with her and continued the conversation that Joe had already begun with her. And she said yes to the Lord that, that uh, Wednesday night. And so God is great. God is uh, really at work. And so they're here this morning. And so we're great, grateful for that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, just, just to go out, God's already work, and just, just joining him in it. It's, he is creating the opportunities. And and then it's to continue the conversation because we want to we want to raise up a, another generation of believers uh, immediately who are going out to uh, to share with others. That's a great uh, a great story. Thank you, thank y'all so much. And and you need to be a, always have a story to tell. And if you're always on mission, you're always going to have just an amazing thing of God is doing incredible things out there. And it's great to get to be a part of it. Thank you all so much. Special appreciation to these folks. So in the, uh, in the time we have left, uh, I want to talk about three application points uh, for all of us uh, based on, on the, the story that Chad read and, and, and talked to us about. And what's great is that the four testimonies, the four stories that you heard, um, kind of already preached the sermon, so uh, um, you can leave now if you're, if you're ready to go. Um, but no, 
the, it, so, but, but the, first, the first application point, and it seems really, really obvious, um, but, but I, I don't want to assume anything, but the, the first one is this. Everyone needs Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. First Timothy 2, 5 through 6 says, There is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And, and I don't want you to miss that word, one. There is only one. There's not, it's not one of many, but it, there is just one. And, and, and here's the reality that, that we, we face in our world, but here's a reality that we face sometimes in our church is, is that maybe even Christians would say sometimes that Jesus, he's really not the only way to heaven. I mean, God's, God's loving, right? So he's, he's not going to allow people to... To, to spend an eternity separated from him. He, like, like, I know this guy. This guy's a good person. Or, or I know her. She's, she's an amazing person. She does great things. But it, it most all things kind of point to God anyway, right? All religions. But the reality is that there is only one way to a relationship with God, and that's through Jesus Christ. So that, that means that if there's only one way, then we all need him. We all need to know that way. And if all people need Jesus, then we better make sure that we're making ourselves available. Availability is, is a key obstacle uh, that keeps us from sharing our faith. We, we just, we, we don't take the time. Uh, you, you looked at the Six Flags story from Raphael, okay? He was busy watching his kids. He could have, he could have used, um, no one would have faulted him for saying, you know, I'm here with my kids, watching my kids. Or no one would have faulted him from saying no to the survey. There was, he, he didn't do anything, but the fact that he made himself available. And, and I think we, we would like to say that we're too busy. Um, and, but, but I think the bigger issue is not that, that we're busy. It's just that we're just not thinking about it. And, and I get it. I'm this way, too. Um, um, I, 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 get, I get caught up in my day. And it's easy to get lost in, in your routine it's easy to get lost in, in the day-to-day -day of lives because we have so much stuff going on, right? We have family, and we have work, and we have our kids, and there's school and stuff that's going on at home. There's just a lot of stuff in our lives, and it becomes so easy to fill up our days. And we just kind of put our head down, and we, we just, we just kind of want to plow through our day. We want to make it through our day. But unfortunately, that means that sometimes we miss opportunities to share Jesus to, to try to engage people in, in gospel conversations. And, and I think another issue is that we don't, we don't always see people like Jesus sees people. We need to value, value people like Jesus valued them. Uh, and he doesn't just see the, the outward appearance. We know this from Scripture. Jesus just doesn't see people. He, he sees their hearts. He knows that, that people have needs. We, we know we know that people have needs. We have, we have our own needs. But the greatest need that anyone has is forgiveness of sins and being in a relationship with Jesus. Uh, the woman that, that, that we read about in John 4, she, she had a, a lot of issues. She had a lot of stuff. But her biggest issue was that she was living apart from a relationship with God. We need to see value in other people. And when we see value, then that will, that will, we will want to pursue them. We need to see people like Jesus sees people. And that means that we're going to have to confront some of our, our very own biases. We've got to confront our biases. I looked up the, in the dictionary, just wanted to make sure I had the right definition. Because <laughs> when I think bias, but, but here's what it says. A particular tendency, a trend, an inclination, a feeling, or an opinion, especially one that is preconceived or unreasoned. So you've just already... You've got this bias towards something. You, you, whether whether, you, whether it's, a, it's based on fact or not, you've kind of already have this, this thought in your head. And whether, whether we want to admit it or not, we have some of those preconceived or, or unreasoned opinions about people and about circumstances that, that really get in the way of us having gospel conversations. Race, gender, social status, the, these, are, these are real biases for, for some of us. The woman at the well, I mean, you, you, look, at, you look at her, and she was, A, a woman. So back in, in Jesus' time, there wasn't much, much status in, in place for women. Not only that, she wasn't married. She'd been married five times. Now, whether that was through a divorce or maybe she was widowed, but, but she did not have a, a man attached to her 
And so, and that had happened to her five times. So more than likely the life she was living and, and don't forget there's men attached to that too. So I don't want this to all go on the women. These guys aren't making good decisions either, but so she has all these decisions or these relationships that aren't working. And right now she's not living in, in, uh, in a, a relationship with, with a husband, and she's a Samaritan, so there's another strike against her. So these are, these are all huge, huge reasons um, why Jesus could have, and some would probably argue should have, never said a word to her. But Jesus, he doesn't fall prey to any, to any bias. Why? Because it goes back to, to the main point. He, he knew that this woman needed him. He knew that she needed forgiveness that he could offer, the transformation that only he could offer, the new life that only comes through him. And, and some of our own biases, and, and we'll just call them what they are, the prejudices, sometimes they cause us to see other people as less than us. They don't, they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't act like I do. They don't value what I value. They're, they're, just, they're different than me, and so they're, they're just not up up to par. So why, why invest there? Why should I waste my time? But, but the, the reality is I can't think of anything more unloving or more unbiblical than to look at someone and judge them or deem them that they are unworthy of our time, or worse yet, unworthy of, of, of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you, you want to know the truth, the truth is none of us are worthy of his love. None of us, but it's through grace, the thing that Chad talked about, that saving grace, a grace that God offers that forgiveness to all of us, not because of who we are, not because of what we've done, not because of what we deserve. We deserve, we deserve eternal punishment, but God chooses to give us love. Another bias that we have to confront is this bias towards comfort. This is my favorite bias, by the way. Gospel conversations, they're just too hard. They're too awkward. What if, what if it doesn't go well? What if they ask me tough questions? What if they, what if they won't be my friend anymore? What if they, they think I'm weird? I, I, I don't want to bother anyone. I, I, and I know that those are real issues. I, I feel them too. As a matter of fact, this is... I, what I'm kind of doing is I'm kind of confessing in front of you, and I, this sermon's really not for you, it's more for me. I'm kind of just preaching to myself here, and you get to hear it. But, but I feel all those things too, because I've, I've said all those things. But if, if I'm honest with myself, what I'm really saying is it's just it's too hard. It's, it's just not in, my, it's not in my comfort zone. And I think what happens is when we think about gospel conversations is we immediately go to worst-case scenario. We immediately think the worst without ever considering the fact that it really might not be that bad. What, what if the person that you're, you're worried about sharing the gospel with, what if they're wondering why you've never invited them to, to church somewhere where they know that you go every week? Or what if they're wondering that, you know, why you have never shared your, anything about your faith with them, but they know that it's, it's super important to you? And... And then, so what if you do share the gospel with them? And they say, well, you know, no thanks, or that's just, that's not me, or I'm glad that's, that's you. You've got your thing, I've got my thing. So what if, what if that's it? But, but you know, I, I think sometimes it's hard, it's hard to think about this sometimes, but how many of the opportunities I've, opportunities that I've missed simply because for me, it wasn't convenient, it wasn't easy it wasn't on my agenda or because really I was I just felt too uncomfortable um, another bias we have is is the the bias that says that it's it's not my job it's not my job we somehow we somehow seem to think that sharing the gospel is it's a special calling it's like well I'm I'm called to work with kids or I'm called to work with students or, or I, I'm, I'm I feel led to work in, in music ministry or I, I work for with the medical team or the security team or or food pantry or ESL those those are my callings but I don't I don't really feel called to to share the gospel that's that's really the the minister's job I think there's a there's an article that just came out from George Barna that, that Chad shared with the staff this week and uh, the title of the article is, is pretty revealing. It says, sharing faith is increasingly optional to Christians. And it's, it's a fascinating look at results from, from, um, from surveys that were done. Uh, one, uh, one, I believe, was in 93, and then, one, and then it was redone here recently. And one of the numbers, one of the statistics that stood out to me was it said that in 93, 89% of Christians who shared their faith agreed that this is a responsibility of every believer. 
But now, today, that number dropped to 64%. So that's, that's a 25-point drop. And if you know statistics, that's a, that's a significant drop from 89% that said it's the responsibility of every believer to now just 64%. We're no longer seeing it as the responsibility of, of every believer. A lot of people say that's, that's the church's job. It's the church's job to share the, to share the gospel with people, but what, really what we're doing is we're kind of separating ourselves from the church, but the only problem with that is that God calls us. We are his church. The people, we, we, are, we are the bride of Christ. Um, so what's, what's happening here? Uh, here's a, another quote from the article. It says, Why are Christians so reluctant to talk about their faith? The overarching cultural trends of secularism, relativism, pluralism, and, and the digital age are contributing to a society that is less and less interested in religion and that has marginalized the place of spirituality in everyday life. It goes on. It says, As a result, Christians in America today have to live in the tension Okay? We have to live in the tension between Jesus' commands to tell others the good news and the growing cultural taboos against proselytizing. So bottom line is, it's not easy to share the gospel because we have a world that's more and more disinterested in it. It's not as easy as it used to be. We have a world that they're, they're less interested. They think God's not necessary. Again, like I said, good for you, but not good for me. So what that means is we have to be more intentional about entering into gospel conversations. Sharing your faith is it's not a special call for, for, for some of the elite believers. This is something that we're all called to do. It's, it's a basic, basic expectation and responsibility for all believers. So if, if we have a world that's less and less interested in the gospel or in God, then, then what it means is that we have to get to the gospel, and we need to get to it quickly. You've, you've probably heard this quote, and, and it goes something like this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, you guys know this. And, and I, I think for a long time, that's how we've operated as a church We've said that you have to, you, we've made it almost a requirement. You have to build a relationship with a person before you can share the gospel. But that's not, that's not really biblical. And if you look at Jesus, Jesus didn't really follow that model at all. But sometimes developing that relationship, it kind of becomes the force field that we hide behind and, and, and why we never really ever get to the gospel. Well, they don't, they don't know me that well, or, or I don't know them that well, and, and I, you know, I don't want to offend them. It, it, might, it might ruin our friendship. They, they seem like good people. You heard Gail talk about this. You know, the, they go to church. They're, they're, they're really good folks. But a lot of times we're, we're so busy working on the relationship that we, that we never, ever get to the gospel. And please don't hear me say that, that, that relationships aren't important. They are important. We should be investing our lives in other people. We should be loving all people. Jesus, he developed relationships, but it was never, ever at the expense of the gospel. We're called to love people, all people. But please don't prioritize the relationship over the gospel. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. I love that part. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you. So what you're, when you're entering in a gospel conversation, you're telling your story. And we forget that that's our purpose as God's, that we are God's ambassadors to this world. That's, that's why we're here. We all have the same job, but we just work at different places. You may work at home, or you may work, you know, downtown, or you may work here in Allen, or you may up north, or you're a teacher, or a doctor, or a nurse, or a police officer, or whatever. But we're all ha we, we, we all have the same job, and that's to be ambassadors, ambassadors of God, but we just work at different places. So now, if, if you share the gospel, in, in, and maybe let's say they don't want any part of it, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you, you stop being their friend. It doesn't mean that you, you stop investing in them. I mean, Jesus, he loved, he loved everyone, and Jesus ministered to a, a bunch of people who never followed him, who, who never chased after him. But the point is, is that we need to get to the gospel. And some of, you, some of you have known people for years and years, and you've never once brought up 
your relationship with Christ. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's the part that we need to avoid. And quite honestly, some of the hardest people to share with are the people that we've known the longest. I get it. I get it because I've done it. There's people that, that you know, even to this day, or I, I know it's gonna be a little, it'll, it'll be a little weird, and it has been a little weird. But here's, here's what you do. If you, if you have that relationship of someone that maybe you've known a while, and you have this, this relationship with them, and, and you've never shared the gospel, here's, here's something you can do. Let's just say Chad's that guy for me. Um, we've known each other for a long time, and uh, I've never once shared my face, so here's, here's what I do. I, I go to Chad, and I just, I simply say, Chad, I gotta apologize to you for something. And I'm sure he'll kind of give me the, you know, the little head nod, like, you know, what? what are you talking about? I said, it's, it's probably no big deal to you, but, you know, we've, lo- we've known each other for the last 10, 15 years, and, and I've never once talked to you about my faith, and that's, it's really super important to me, and I don't, I don't really know where you are, with all of that, but I just, I just need to take a couple of seconds to tell you about something that's, that, that really changed my life. And, and when I'm done, we can talk more about it if you want to, or we don't have to talk about it. But really, it's just it's kind of my bad for never, never bringing that up before. Just an easy transition, right? Easy. I know it's not that easy. But we, we have to, we have to try. You look at Jesus, and Jesus went right to it with this, this woman at the well. He didn't spend a lot of time getting to know her situation. He didn't spend a lot of time developing a friendship with her. He didn't spend, what he did was, is he got straight to the gospel. And it's time for for us to to get to the gospel. That remember, that's that's everyone's greatest need. We need to start engaging with people that we know, the people that we care about, the people that mean the most to us. And one of the greatest honors that we have when someone does say yes to Jesus is that we get to join them on their journey. We're not really called to share the gospel and then leave them. And, and I realize sometimes that does happen because we, we, we minister to people, we go on mission trips and we minister to people who, who we'll, we may never ever see again, and that's okay. We're always trying to connect them with other people, connect them to other churches. But a lot of times the people that we get, we get to share with, when they say yes, we get to join them on the journey because we're not called to share the gospel and leave. We're called to, to make disciples who, who then make disciples. You heard that story um, with Tom, who shared with Joe, who then began to share with people who were most important in his life. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, a, a, a foundation verse for us as a church is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. Jesus could have left but if, if you read further on uh, in, in that chapter, uh, John mentions that, that Jesus stayed a, a couple of extra days with, with this lady and, and her family and, and her friends. And the point necessarily isn't the time that he stayed, but the point is that he invested in them, in these new believers. And because of his investment with the believers, other people came to know and other people learned about him. And we do a great disservice, I think, sometimes when we lead someone to Christ and then we leave them. And here's the big question for a lot of new believers, and this is probably a question that you had when you first came to know Christ, is what, what do I do now? And as a follower of Christ, that's part of what we do, is we help answer that question. And I can't think of a better investment of our time than to help a new believer to grow in their knowledge of obedience, and in their knowledge and obedience to God. Walking with them, that means that you encourage them You help keep them accountable. You're challenging them. You're praying with them and for them. You're discovering answers to questions together. And it also means that your relationship is going to grow too. One of the most mature things that you can do as a follower of Jesus is to disciple someone else. So the question then is to all of us as believers, what is your next step when it comes to a gospel conversation? Is there, is there a bias, one of the biases that we talked about that you need to confront in your own life? Is there a person that you've known for a long time who needs to hear, finally needs to hear your faith journey, your faith story? Is there someone that you know that's, that's a, what we would like to call maybe a baby Christian? They're, they're, new to the, they're new to all this and they don't really know what to do, but maybe you can join them in their journey. You see, Jesus had every reason to, to not engage with this woman at the well. But 
because he did, her life and other lives were forever changed. And here's what God wants to do. God wants to use your gospel conversation. He wants to use your story to help other people to know him and so that their lives will be changed and then people that they know that their lives will be changed and on and on. There's an evangelist uh, and seminary professor named C.E. Autry. He's a famous, famous guy and just such a, a passion to see people who are far from God come into a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And he told about a friend of his in one of his books that uh, I have. I have a collection of older books. This is an older book from another generation. It's about a guy named John Basser. And John was not a pastor. He was just a guy who thought everybody ought to get a chance to hear about Jesus. And so wherever he was, whatever he was doing, John Basser was, he's coming out of New York. John Basser wanted to talk about Jesus. And so this is the story. So John, he's walking through the lobby of a hotel where he was staying. He sees this woman sitting by herself. No one else is around. He just has that, that prompting that I'll just walk over and start a conversation with her. So he walked over. And he, he said, and for the time period, work pretty well. We, we have different ways. We're training to have entryways into gospel conversations that are really simple, get you started. Like John talked about, to offer to pray for someone, just open so many doors. For John Vassar, he walked over to the woman and said, let me ask you, are you a Christian? Well, that's a pretty, pretty big question to ask somebody. And they started into a conversation back and forth, and he shared the gospel with her. And, and she didn't accept Christ into her life, surrender her life to Christ in that moment, but they had the conversation. He planted the seeds because our responsibility is uh, not to make a sale. Our responsibility is to share who Jesus is and what Jesus can do in a life and plant gospel seeds. Well, John Bassard shared... Uh, she said, let me think about that. And that was in the end of the conversation. He left. And the woman's husband came down. He'd been in a meeting. He came down. And she starts telling her husband this story about this complete stranger who walked up to her in the hotel lobby and asked, are you a Christian? Well, as soon as she said that, her husband said, well, I hope you told him it was none of his business. And she told him, if, if you'd seen, seen his face... When he asked the question, if you'd heard his voice when he asked the question, you, you'd just know it really was his business. Would anybody say that about you? Would anyone say, they're just always about the Father's business. They're just always on mission. They just want other people to experience a life-changing, uh, transforming, grace-filled power of Jesus Christ. We have such a great opportunity people all around us that God's already preparing who need to know Christ. And uh, here's what I'd like for us to do in our commitment time just now. To, to think, okay, what do I need to do to take a, a next step just to be better prepared? And that maybe that's getting into a conversation with, with one of those four people there or any number of folks who've been a part of our gospel conversations, trainings, and uh, learn how you can just get into the conversation. Maybe just making a list. Here are people I know who may not know Christ that I can start praying for. But specifically, could you just come up with one person that really, you said, this person, I care so much for them. It's somebody at work. It's somebody in my neighborhood. It's somebody in my family who needs to know Jesus. And, and you'd say, God, give me the opportunity just to, to walk across a room to, to care enough to, to ask and just push against the door of a heart and see where God might be at work. Write down the name of that person somewhere where you're going to see it, where you're going to have it, and then look for an opportunity to just take a step. God's already at work.